Hey class, in this lesson we're going to look at Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics Book 2. So Aristotle has now argued that the good is that towards which all things aim. So he defines the good as the goal or telos at which things aim. So human life is a kind of activity uh, we act by moving our bodies, by having certain goals. I want to become a mathematician, or I want to uh, get this job, or I want to build this uh, house, or uh, anything like that. We have this kind of teleological structure. We strive for a goal. Um, and so human the human good will be that towards which human life as a whole strives. And since Aristotle defines human life in terms of rationality, what makes us truly different from animals is our use of reason and language. Um, the, the human goal which will define our greatest good will be the improvement of our virtues. We'll, it will be the improvement of our intellectual faculties and of our rational capacities such that uh, on the one hand we can do things like philosophy but on the other hand we can do the right thing at the right time in the right way. Bring about the right kind of goal. Uh, bring about the goal that we want in any kind of situation. So that's how Aristotle defines virtue. Um, and based on his idea of the good. In book two, he goes into uh, what, what we'll call like a precondition of fulfilling that good. And we've touched on this already in this idea of the dynamic sense of being and the relation of matter and form um, in terms of a developmental uh, approach to understanding. Um, you go from one stage to the next and the the prior stages are preconditions for the later stages. So here in book two, Aristotle kind of zooms in on the earlier stage. Um, what is required before we get to things like virtues of the mind and reason. Um, and those are what he calls character. And we've touched on that already uh, very briefly. But character is kind of the amalgamation of life experiences. And so central to this idea of character is the idea of habit. And in Greek, the words character, habit, ethics, all of these words are closely linked. And so that's what we're going to see in this lesson. So the basic idea here, and this is another analogy, as we've talked about in the dynamic sense of being, uh, thinking is to learning as, so that's the point where you get the, that it's an analogy. So thinking is to learning as character is to habit. So if thinking is the goal of learning and it's what we acquire through the process of learning, character is what we acquire through the processes of habit. And then Aristotle calls habit a second nature. And we hear this, uh, this is a common phrase people use today, it actually comes from Aristotle. So uh, you could say like, oh yeah, for him, like, I don't know, riding a bike was second nature or uh, casting his fishing rod was a second nature, right? It means something that has become so ingrained in someone's abilities that it's as if it was their nature. Um, and so we should say really quick what uh, he means by nature here. Um, he makes this really clear in the following example. He says, if I throw a, a rock 100 times, it always falls. So you throw a rock into the air and it falls. And you do this over and over again, expecting something to change and it never changes. Why? It's the nature of a rock to fall. That's what Aristotle says. Um, so it has that tendency. Its nature is to fulfill that tendency. But uh, unlike rocks, uh, humans and animals act very differently when they repeat actions. So if you repeat a behavior a hundred times, 
there will be a change in the disposition, right? So if you practice a song on piano a thousand times or a hundred times, you'll be able to learn that song. You will acquire a kind of disposition, a tendency. Or if you ride your bike a hundred times or even throwing the rock, right? By the hundredth throw of the rock, you're going to be much better at throwing a rock. The rock won't have changed. Its nature stays the same, but you'll have this kind of second nature, this ability to throw the rock much higher or whatever. So that's what the idea of a habit is. It's a habit is something formed by repetition. And once a habit is formed, it's a tendency. So it's something that kind of automatically happens. Um, you might have, you know, the habit of waking up and just walking into your bathroom and brushing your teeth or something like that. And you can be half awake, not even thinking about it, and just start doing it. Habits are like that. Or if you have a habit of, I have a habit of touching my face or something like that, I'll do it without thinking. And it'll just automatically go. So that's what a tendency is. It's a kind of automatic uh, uh, enacting of something that we have repeated and therefore has become a disposition. And so we automatically do it. And this is the basis for character in Aristotle. Re repetition of actions and imitation of actions that leads to repetitions and uh, that's the basis of character. And we saw that already in the Republic. So Aristotle, within this realm of character and habit, he wants to cut it up and to make clear the different aspects of it because it's a highly complex uh, realm in which philosophy needs to make distinctions in order for us to understand it. And so he produces this large list here that I have uh, of the different distinctions. And so I'm just going to go through those uh, and try and make sense of what the differences between them are. So the main three things are habit, which is the word ethos, and then character, which is ethos. So you can see they're closely related. And then hexis, which is a kind of activity or uh, active disposition. And all of these words are based off of the same Greek word, eke which means to have or to hold. So you have a certain disposition, you have habits, you have a character. Um, so how do we have these things? We have them in different ways, and that's why we have these different words. So habit, as we said, is this process of repetition in which something comes to be a tendency. It comes to be an acquired disposition. So. Ethos is this acquired tendency to act or feel certain emotions. Um, so you habitually do things, you habitually feel things. Um, now, in distinction with habits, uh, we have uh, hexes or activities. Um, they are more deliberate, more active, more careful more poised. You can think of the difference as maybe like a goalie in soccer. Um, the goalie has certain habits uh, of acquired ways of moving to block the ball and things like that. And in the right moment, they will use those habits in order to catch the ball. But the hexis, this active side, would be their vigilance, watching and uh, sort of deliberating and making decisions on which side of the goal to stand on based on the movement of the of the game. So the 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 habits are these acquired abilities to move in certain ways. But hexis is this way of deliberately poising yourself and being carefully oriented towards a situation. Um, so the hexis will make use of habits, but the hexis this activity is something that is enacted uh, actively and carefully, right? So, so character is the overall unity of all of your memories, habits, um, all of your ways of entering into a situation in a deliberate way. So that's what a persona is. It's, it's a way of taking up the situation. So you walk into a classroom 
and you see that there's a chair and you go and sit in it and you get out your stuff you do that because your your persona is a student you're living out the idea of being a student it's directing your uh way of acting that doesn't mean that your character is completely defined by being a student your ethos your character is a very complex thing that incorporates your memories your habits the fact that you're also a soccer player as well as being a student right so it's all of those things put together you also play a musical instrument or something like that um, in one situation you'll be enacting a certain way of entering into that search uh, situation you'll be ta uh, uh, you know undertaking a certain way of engaging in the situation a certain persona you enter the room as a student or you enter the room as a teacher those are very different ways of relating to the room and the people in it right uh, so you can change your personas your habits your memories you have many memories and all of these things it's the totality of those that makes the character makes character what it is so you are your whole ensemble of all of those features so that's the difference between a habit character and an activity um, habits we have many of them we only have one character our character is our self as a whole um, and we enact our character in a kind of deliberate poised active way in given situations but none of those will ever exhaust the unity that is our whole person our whole character um, and Aristotle makes two other uh, important distinctions here the first is emotions so emotions are things like happiness and sadness they are kind of change that we undergo in relation to things so uh, you know you go to get a meal and they place the food in front of you and all of a sudden you're happy right you kind of respond to the situation by feeling an emotion um, and then maybe you finish the food and you're sad and when you're waiting for the food you feel desire these are emotions there are ways in which we feel this the significance of the situation um, now Aristotle uh, makes a another very like hair splitting distinction here between emotions and dispositions so dispositions are like emotions so uh, someone who's disposed to being angry has an angry temper um, they feel the emotion of anger often um, so we're not here just talking about the emotion we're talking about a certain tendency um, with relation to that emotion but a disposition is not like character in the sense that someone who is just a, a curmudgeon and a miser uh, someone who's just angry all the time so they have the character of that but let's say that a bunch of bad things happen to you throughout the day and you get home and you're just in this angry or like desperate uh, kind of state you're hang hangry right as we say um, that's a disposition so it's a temporary way of holding that tendency today I feel that way that doesn't mean my character is like that but I have a sort of disposition I'm disposed towards being in that mood so you can be disposed to being happy and so one day you're like I don't know why but I'm just in a kinda of good mood today that's a disposition unless it's your character unless it's like man that person is just always happy right so those are the differences there and a lot of the uh, uh, you know fine cutting here uh, is degrees right like an emotion is part of the disposition and a disposition could gradually become character if you you know are angry every day and become angry every day then eventually that'll become part of your character and eventually you'll be a curmudgeon so uh, time plays a really important role here and each one of these is developing uh, greater and greater uh, um, deep-seated uh, 
you acquire you know more and more these kind of character as you repeat these kinds of actions so dispositions become uh, character um, and yeah dispositions they are situational so a certain situation might make you disposed towards a certain way of feeling so there's kind of like trigger response kind of aspect going on here and it's spontaneous insofar as we don't choose it so you don't just choose to be in a good mood you don't just choose to be in a bad mood it's kind of spontaneously comes about not that there aren't causes of it but that it's not something that we will it's not vo entirely voluntary um, although aristotle does think that we can develop ways in which to better uh organize our life and that's the whole point of the ethics this book is how do we organize our life towards a better way of being disposed in situations so how do we form a character which best serves our ability to develop virtues and reason so aristotle introduces this idea that is really uh a Greek idea um, that permeates kind of Greek thought in a way and that's the idea of the golden mean and Aristotle here uh, formulates it into an ethical theory that is rationally um, consistent and systematic um, but it touches on or it draws from uh, an idea that was very prevalent in Greece and in other uh, civilizations all over the world we see this idea coming up um, and in traditions all over the world so the idea is that everything should be in moderation right nothing too much that's what this uh, epithet that was at uh, the temple in Delphi that we've seen with Socrates many times now so this epithet says maiden agon nothing too much um, everything in moderation nothing in excess agon meaning excess um, so what we strive for in character is a kind of balance and what is it a balance of it's a balance of pleasure and pain so these are our basic emotions at any moment in time we feel these emotions and we either feel pleasure pain or indifferent um, and desire as well that goes along with these um, and desire for Aristotle as a side note is a kind of mixture of pleasure and pain it's a pleasure at the idea of the thing you desire and a pain at the feeling that you don't have it yet so it's a complex emotion that involves a little bit of pleasure and a little bit of pain um, so the 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 goal of uh, forming character is to form a proper balance of pleasure and pain for Aristotle and so he thinks that this is very clear in the virtues that are already recognized within Greece and two of those that we can look at are courage and temperance um, and these refer back to uh, in a way from the Republic the mixed nature of the philosopher the philosopher needs to be both courageous and temperate so both uh, um, confident and you know forward moving and willing and as well uh, self-conscious and restrained and willing to reflect and be uh, um, reflective yeah so let's look at both of these how do they balance uh, pleasure and pain well imagine you're going into war which is a place that courage was commonly considered to be expressed but it's not uh exclusively there for the greeks um especially for aristotle um but okay so we're going into a dangerous situation like war and you feel fear which is a kind of pain but you also feel uh this kind of pleasure of being confident and ready to go well if you have too much of one or the other of these you don't have courage so let's say you have too much fear well then you fall into cowardice so you drop below the the mean the the proper measure in the middle um, and let's say you're too confident 
on the other hand. You have too much of this, like, ah, oh, I can do anything, and then you go in and you die because you weren't being cautious enough. So courage is not just being blindly, uh, you know, not having any fear whatsoever. It's being properly balanced between fear and confidence. It's this kind of uh, middle ground between fear and confidence. And uh, we see this in temperance as well. So temperance, the Greek word is sophrosune. It means something like preserving uh, a kind of wiseness um, or uh, maintaining a sort of uh, um, deliberately deliberate mindedness, a um, being cautious, but not to the point of being overly cautious. Um, a kind of virtue of comp cautiousness. Um, so temperance is a mean between the extremes of abstinence and indulgence. So in the feeling of uh, pleasure and pain in a certain situation, you can either indulge in that pleasure or abstain from that pleasure. And in a certain pain, you can either indulge in that pain or abstain from that pain. And what temperance is, is a mean uh, balancing out these two tendencies. So if you have no self-restraint, you will just eat a piece of cake as soon as you see it. Doesn't matter if it's yours, doesn't matter if you've already, you know, eaten a bunch that day or whatever. In To be intemperate, uh, to lack temperance means to be unable to restrain yourself from uh, indulgence. Or it means to be overly abstinent. So it means that you uh, go to the opposite extreme of just not partaking in pleasures and pain at all. And Aristotle says that this is against human nature because human nature is natural to feel certain pleasures and feel certain pains. And so the virtue there is to feel the right pleasures in the right way at the right time. And so the golden mean is all about this focusing of our attention and our desire towards the pleasure and the pain of the right thing at the right time in the right way. So character is developed by repeating actions that bring about a certain uh, tendency towards pleasure and pain in the right way. And in this dynamic sense of being, this developmental stages of life, the matter, the material from which virtue comes about is character. So in order to build a statue, you have to make bronze first. And in order to make bronze, remember, you have to mix together copper and tin. Well, in the uh, in character, you have to mix together pleasure and pain in the right way so that you can create a good character, right? You have to mix these things together and create the, the substrate from which the statue is built. Well, here we have to create the character from which virtues can emerge. So one must have good character if they're going to develop virtues. And so if you can't moderate your desires, you won't be able to focus on learning intellectual things. Or if you can't moderate your desires, you won't be able to act justly towards someone else, right? You'll see an opportunity to take advantage of them. And then rather than uh, the rational part of yourself coming and saying, no, you really need to like uh, respect this person and not act unjustly towards them and take advantage of them. But if you don't have a good character, you won't be able to have reason uh, play that role. So, you know, you might have that voice, but then the desire takes over and you end up just fulfilling uh, the, the goal of that desire rather than fulfilling what reason tells you.